welcome everyone. I'm Peter Friend. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land and pay our respect to all First Nation elders, past, present and emerging. Extending this respect to all brother boys and sister girls and other Aboriginal trans and gender diverse people, we celebrate your continuing connection, contribution to culture, country and community. In 2016, I created an event for trans and gender diverse people to celebrate our stories. Not just our coming out stories or stories that answer the questions everyone asks about, like pronouns and name changes or hormones and surgeries, but stories about who we are as people. What are our hopes, our fears, our dreams? The event went on to premiere at the 2018 Mardi Gras Festival. I brought on producer Lisa Freshwater, and through her company, we've produced the event at three Mardi Gras festivals and at the Brisbane Powerhouse for the Melt Festival, creating a platform for many trans and gender diverse people to share their unique and wonderful narratives. Today, we're thrilled to feature highlights from this events on this iconic Sydney Opera House stage. Together, but socially distanced. It might look like we're all speaking from the same lectern on camera, but we're actually swapping between two lecterns. And each will be cleansed between speakers to ensure we're following COVID safe practices. So let's begin. As I mentioned, I'm Peter Friend, and this is my trans story. I am wearing a wedding ring. It's something I've dreamt about my whole life. This ring represents that I'm complete, that someone loves me enough to accept me unconditionally, that I have a place as a daughter, as a woman, and as myself but it wasn't always this way. The year is 1978, I'm 17, and I'm walking into my very first gay bar on Sydney's Golden Mile, Oxford Street. I'm wide-eyed and terrified, but I'm swept up in the excitement and vibe of the bar, the lights, the pulsating music, the sea of shirtless men. But then the music stops and a spotlight hits the stage and the most beautiful, glamorous woman that I have ever seen appears. She's lip syncing to a song by Diana Ross, but she's not a drag queen. I would learn she was, what we would call back then, a transsexual. That was it for me, Oxford Street and its amazing bars and discos would draw me back time and time again. Not for the men, but for those beautiful and glamorous showgirls. And maybe one or two men. <laughs> The showgirls represented something to me. While I never thought I could be as gorgeous as them, as I stood there watching them, a truth was revealing itself to me. So I sourced as much information as I could find and in those days that was precious little. I read autobiographies by two famous trans legends, April Ashley and Caroline Cossey. They were both life-changing. And I found a doctor on Oxford Street who prescribed hormones. The initial excitement soon faded. A few months into my transition, the hormonal changes turned me into someone I didn't recognise. I felt overwhelmed and alone. So I stopped the treatment and went back to living the gay life. Feeling like a failure, I said to myself that the women I saw on stage and read about in the books were a fantasy and transitioning would only make my life more difficult. I went through the process of going on and off hormones 13 times over 17 years. Every time I went on the treatment, I was hopeful. But each time I stopped, I was broken. So she just continued to live inside me, waiting for permission to emerge full time. In 1994, I received a phone call from one of my dearest friends saying that he was sick 
really sick. The AIDS crisis was upon us. I moved in and became one of his primary carers. And for the first time in my life, I felt needed. I was creating a home and a safe place for both of us. But in our home lived two people, one who was scared of dying and the other who was scared of living. But when you hold the hand of a dying friend and be there as they take their final breath, you're confronted with truth, my truth. But I was now armoured with the will to survive, so I began the process of transitioning for what would be the final time. As the sun rose on the year 2000, I walked into a gay club, hit the dance floor in my size 10 stilettos, and the light was now shining on me. And I'm damn sure I was dancing to a Diana Ross song. Now every day I feel overwhelmed with joy, gratitude and a sense of power that unleashing my female self has allowed me to experience. But in becoming myself, I had to hurt someone whom I loved very much. My mother, mum, Margaret or Mrs. Friend to everyone else was a kind and loving woman. She was textbook perfect. A devoted wife, proud housekeeper and a loving mother to four children three girls and one boy. My father was a carpenter, a provider, a man's man, and I was his son. I couldn't conform to his expectations. And while I lived in fear of him most of my childhood, I've only recently come to understand the unique love story that he shared with my mother. As I grew up, my mother and I became best of friends. We shared many a Saturday afternoon at the movies and connected through our loving, our love of music. When I finally transitioned, I knew this decision would tear her apart and it did. And she made me promise never to tell my father to keep the peace. I kept that promise and kept a distance from my family for 18 years. I never spoke to my father again and he went to his grave three years ago, never knowing that I had transitioned, never knowing me. During those 18 years, I maintained fortnightly phone calls with my mother, but I was never really able to share of myself. And when I did, I would get a stony silence. I came to accept that she would never see me as her daughter. In one heated conversation, She actually shouted at me, I want my son back. I could hear the desperation and pain in her voice and it broke my heart. My mother passed away last year and along with my three sisters, I was by her side. In the days before she died, I wanted to reconnect with her, to thank her for everything she had done for me, to say the words, I never got to say to my father, to apologise for the pain, but I couldn't. The words would get stuck in my throat. But before she died, she looked me in the eyes and said, I love you. And that was enough. In the days after her passing, I was going through some photos of hers when I came across an old Kodak envelope with the words Peter written on it, spelt P-E-T-A. I knew it was for me to find. Inside were about 20 photos of me at various stages of my male life. And in the back was a note written in my mother's handwriting with these words. To have and to love and then to part is the greatest sorrow of one's heart. In that moment, I understood her grief and the pain she must have felt as she mourned for her only son in silence. My mother left her daughters and granddaughters special pieces of jewellery, an engagement ring, an eternity ring, her pearl earrings. But for me, she left me her wedding ring. I wear it with pride 
Maybe this is her way of saying, you are loved, you belong in my heart, you are my daughter. This is my mum, Katie, I'm Mark, and this is my trend story. Everything changed just over a month ago. I got cookie dough. I finally convinced my mum to buy me cookie dough. It's only taken nearly all my life. That's 11 years. But just over, wait, just over a month ago, she finally gave in. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Mum says I'm more independent now, my, I'm more responsible, and I'm finally allowed to go to and from school by myself. Which was an extremely stressful and anxious time for me. Every possible bad scenario played out in my head, like oh, him getting lost, getting kidnapped, getting murdered. My mind was going nuts until he walked through the door. Oh my God, Mum, you only thought that because you watch those murder shows to go to sleep. Well, I, I like the YouTuber's voice, their rhythm, their tone. I mean, they could talk about anything. They're just so relaxing, it just puts me to sleep. <laughs> Anyway, Mum, we're talking about my independence. Yeah, I know. Going to and from school. Mm -hmm. It is so good because my, it is so good because my mum can be very embarrassing. I don't think she realizes how loud she can be, not just talking, but with her whole body. Mm -hmm. She waves her hands around like crazy when she talks, and for some reason moves her whole body. People look and stare at her like she was a weirdo. So I try to distract her or, or I pretend I want to hold, hold her hand. Hold your hand, I want to hold. See, it works. That usually keeps mum quiet. Another reason why I like being able to go to school by my, wait. Another reason I go home by myself is because I get to spend more time with my friends. And I don't have to go to after school care. There's never anyone fun to play with. There. And I don't have to go to my old babysitter's place. I hated going there. It was so boring didn't, and I didn't like their food. It was soggy and gross. No matter what they made, it was soggy and gross. Toast, soggy and gross. Chocolate cake, soggy and gross. Vegemite sayos, soggy and gross. These things are not meant to be soggy and gross. Plus, they didn't wash their hands. Their fingers were manky. Oh, I think I'm going to throw up. Let's change the subject. Hey, enough now. It wasn't that bad there. Mum, you never stayed there as long as I did, or overnight. No, but I have known them since I moved down from Queensland when I was a teenager. You still didn't stay there as long as I did. Well, how do you know? Yeah, I did, longer, for days. Sometimes I'd just sit outside and I'd go to my friend's place. I, you know, I don't really go there to sleep. Well, I would do that too now, but before I was too little and I was scared of everything. Since we got cookie dough, I feel braver. Mum is usually at rehearsals or on set and doesn't come home until a few hours after me. She always calls in our afternoon break, which I like, but if I'm being honest, mum can be annoying like cookie sometimes. She's always saying the same thing every time I'm on the phone. How was school? That's not too annoying because I do like to spill the tea. I tell mum nearly everything. Some things she doesn't need to know. Year five is full of dramas, maybe because everyone is a preteen and starting to go through puberty. The other day I saw a tampon on the playground. It was weird. I knew it was because I just started my, you know what. Anyway, I shared too much information. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, being so, I will start blockers soon. I just have to get some X, bo bone x-ray thing done or something. I just can't wait. Well, I can wait for the needle, but I can't wait for the blockers. Actually, to be honest, I can't wait till I start tea, get hairy and grow my first beard and feel comfortable as me. Yeah, I can't wait for that too. What are you talking about? For when you grow up to be an adult and do all those adult things. What's adult things? Adulting. Adulting isn't a thing. It is. What is it then? Adulting. <laughs> Mum, no, it's not. And then you grow your beard and you feel all deadly and comfortable as you. Mum, you're lucky I'm your kid because I don't think anyone else will be able to put up with your weirdness. So as I was saying about my independence, yep. Let's let me finish the story. Okay, Mum, I'm listening. Everyone's listening. We're all listening. All ears are on you. <laughs> okay. So when I get home from school, open the door. Cookie Dough is there waiting. It's always the best part of my day. He's so excited to see me as I open the door. He jumps up and down. 
It's so nice to be loved like that. Cookie dough is a pugilier. That's a king cab in a pig muck. <laughs> Mixed. <laughs> he can be annoying sometimes. When I look at his cute little face, I can't help but love him. And when I first saw your cute little face after 16 hours of labour and I pushed you out of my vagina and you were covered in blood and all purple, you know, my whole world changed. It was from black and white to gold. Then I knew what real love was. I love you. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, and this is my trans story. Theme and variation is a specific form of music. It starts by introducing the listener to a melody or a musical idea. The composer then takes this idea and develops it repeatedly as variations, ensuring the theme in some form is recognisable throughout. Theme. The fear that what I was doing would ruin my life, that my identity led only to rejection. Variation one. I was 16 going on 17 when it dawned on me that being a straight woman just simply did not fit. As this realisation washed over me, a darkness settled as the converse of being a straight woman was being a gay woman and being gay was against the word of God. The fear and the shame of my thoughts layered with the feeling that lesbian was not right either led me into an abyss of isolation in my faith, my family and my friends. You see, when you are Christian, being told that gay is okay by those who do not share your faith does not relieve that gripping feeling of being rejecting by God. In search of an answer, I began asking questions. I thought no one noticed, but then my pastor, he called me in. Starting with the niceties, he quickly changed course. I could sense an agenda, a mission to uncover, to uncover the very thing I had worked so hard to hide. I still remember the feeling as my stomach dropped. I began to unravel confessing my fears. He responded with a reassurance that we, could get through this, that with fortnightly meetings and God's love, I would come to the right choice, the choice to be the straight woman God had made me to be. I can only say how very lucky I am to have a mum who is as astute as mine. A single mum and teacher from the burbs of Adelaide, she is so often overlooked by others, but I can safely say that she is one of the most intelligent, resilient and caring people I know. And it was exactly these qualities that prevented me spiralling too far. One afternoon, as we took our pup Max for a walk, Mum shared her feelings, her fears that something was not right, that until I told her what was happening, she was not to let me back to youth. Again, that drop in my stomach, but this time I had to verbalise it. We walked loops and loops on and on, question after question, my response, no. Until, are you gay? My silence was my answer. I did not have the strength nor the words to look at her, but mum, she welcomed me in with tears in her eyes and the embrace of unconditional love I have only ever experienced in a parent's hug. Variation two. At the end of year 12, I told my pastor I deserved to be open of who I was. This was met with his response that I would need to step down and that Friday tell the other leaders why. Albeit expected, I was devastated. My spiritual home, my haven and my prison was being taken away. I was very clearly being told that I was not welcome there. Fortunately, I had met Sue, a lesbian minister. And when I told her what was happening, she resolved to accompany me that Friday in her vibrant red glasses and spiky-haired queer glory. Not only her, but the whole of the queer Christian women's group Trinity Sisters were waiting outside for me after. Those women, they encircled me with many hugs and reassurances that I was okay and what had happened was not. That night, they bundled me up. 
They fed me hot chocolate and we played board games until the suffocating feeling of loss began to ease. Variation three. I fumbled my way through the following year. I moved out of home, I began university, and I met a multitude of queer folk from more than just the L, the G, and the B. It was liberating, but also terrifying, as I met people that I wished I could be. Living out of home with no real support structures in place, I was struggling. So in my infinite wisdom of just 18 years old, I decided I would move to Canberra and join the Air Force. I survived basic training. It's early mornings with sheets on shoulders and the long, long hours of marching. I even found a comfort in the routine and structure that was now my life. What I was not ready for was that boys wore suits and girls wore frocks. As a lesbian, I was afforded some lenience in this, but these binaries extended far, far further than dress code. I very quickly came to realise that I was not one of the girls and I could no longer pretend nor put this feeling in a box. It was my next trip home, sitting by the river on that mid-autumn day that I realised I had to tell Dad. I had to tell him to let him in as this secret was consuming. That moment, as I began, my mouth went dry. I fumbled my truth, unravelling and stumbling until... I'm transgender. His response, all you need to know is that I love you. What followed did not matter. The rest was irrelevant. Dad knew, he knew in that moment the words that I'd needed. <clears throat> Next came nine long months of living a double life, a woman Monday to Friday and a man in those precious weekend hours. When I finally came out, news of my transition, it spread like wildfire. Before long, everyone was talking of the girl who wanted to be a boy. Over the following months, many incidents ensued and my mental health began to plummet. I was shipped off base in the hopes that if they put me somewhere else, the problem would go away. And whilst away from the problem for more of the time, I was being cast even further as other my only option was to leave. Theme. Each time rejection reared, I could not fathom what lay beyond. It seemed my story was one only of loss. But as I went on, I found my place, my space and my ground. I found a new freedom, a freedom to discover who I was. I learnt that life without faith can still have meaning, that my converse to being a straight woman was not a gay woman, it was being a gay man. I learnt that moving forward does not mean forgetting and that pain can sometimes be too much for one person. My theme is that the people who mattered have remained. The people who walked beside me, who carried me and who waited with me when I could not walk any further. My theme was the warmth of that hot chocolate. It was being wrapped in that hug. It was those words of love that have never left. Hi, I'm Ray Vargas, and this is my trans story. Remember when Love, Simon uh, came out in cinemas back in 2018? The first gay teen romance released by a major film studio? I wrote a review for it for my uni magazine around the time it came out. When it was released, a certain line was printed in large letters. This is the life of a queer person of color scavenging for representation while also being hyper aware of the lack of it. I wasn't aware of that decision, so when the magazine hit the shelves, it surprised me to see my own words in literal block letters. It's kind of what it's like when you're a creator like me who's part of the LGBT community. 
you want to find authentic representation while also creating or even being that representation yourself. And so that begs the question, what do I create? In short, I tell stories in funny voices. But let's establish some context. I'm obsessed with oral. That's A-U-R-A-L. Don't get any ideas, please. I love listening to city life, music, the sounds of nature, the grown-ups around me speaking the three languages in the one sentence. And with music being a staple to my Filipino heritage, it only makes sense to branch out. Audio fiction, it's kind of like a TV series for your ears, it's one of those branches. I just wrapped up the first season of my first podcast, Under the Electric Stars. I played a recurring character, I worked with an amazing team, and I even got paid for my time as we grew our Patreon numbers. I also do bit roles for a podcast in progress titled And195, and even compose and perform the theme for it. And to top it all off, I'm part of the Goose Thunder Podcasting Network, home to podcasts like The Lavender Ladies and Novitero. It's kind of like the Hulu of podcasts. Now, my voice acting venture hasn't always been this grand. It started with a webcomic. There was a webcomic on Tumblr called Rock and Riot written and illustrated by Kiwi artist Chelsea Ferretti, whom I had the pleasure of meeting in person in Supernova back in 2018. I found a casting call for an animated version of, her, of the first chapter of her comic. I prepared an audition, I submitted it, only to be told that there was an age limit of 16 plus. I was 15 and nine months old at the time. So to compensate, I immersed myself in audio fiction by studying it, listening to it, studying everything I can about it. I started off with single voice podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale, and then moved on to other works of different styles like The Thrilling Adventure Hour, and finally moved on to more elaborate works like Gimlet Media's Homecoming. And yes, that's where the Amazon series is based off. And then in 2018, an old friend tells me about the Penumbra podcast. I give it a shot because it's one podcast with two segments. One is this cyber noir setup and the other is this high fantasy Game of Thrones universe. But what really caught me off guard was how casual they are about gender. In the Cyber Noir segment, the protagonist, Juno Steele, is nonchalant about what kind of gendered terms to use on him. Most of the time, he often goes by Mr. or Sir, but other times when he's narrating, he calls himself a lady. Specifically in my favorite line of his, a lady can have his secrets. That was like revelatory. I mean, we're pretty casual about gender in my culture and in my personal circles, but hearing that in Western media was a joy, refreshing. Now, a little thing about me is that I didn't always sound like this. I went on testosterone for six months, but had to stop because of complications. So I have a pretty low voice, but I still have a figure that most of society considers to be feminine. In late 2017, I was auditioning for visual media left and right, looking for jobs as well, something to make my time productive. But whenever I went in for an audition or an interview where I spoke with the person over the phone, they would see me and then they would give me this look that says, oh, you look like that? Hmm. I would go in for theater and they would tell me I'm too short. I would look too different from the cast. I go in for something that involves singing and they tell me that I don't have the appropriate range. I even went for a job interview and they told me my voice would make me too intimidating for customers. So I have this pent up frustration of not fitting whatever expectation or requirement these gigs had. And then I remembered that moment five years ago, when I so badly wanted to be a voice actor for Rock and Riot, that was a moment of inspiration. So I searched for 
casting calls for voice actors. If they didn't like how I looked, maybe they'll like how I sound. I'm in a few Discord servers that are focused on podcasts, so word of mouth led me to projects that needed some talent. Under the Electric Stars was one of them. Several auditions later, and here I am. Podcasts offer me this opportunity to be heard, literally and metaphorically. The audio fiction world offers up this sea of opportunities, especially for representation. Things like Love, Simon and the Penumbra podcast are a taster of what kind of representation this world needs. It's a stepping stone. And my work in podcasts is helping lay down more and more stones along this huge river of diversity, hoping to bridge the gap of representation of the trans community that we desperately need. And while not everything out there is perfect, we're getting closer and closer to more stories about us, for us, by us. My name is T. Uglo, and this is my trans story. <laughs> When I was three or four, I can't start like that. <laughs> Trans existence is rich and complex. There is no type, there's no handbook. I sometimes think that the only thing we have in common is our struggle, both with society and with our bodies. But as it goes, when I was three or four, I knew. I just didn't know what it was that I knew. <laughs> Back then, all I knew was that I was different. And in 1970s Kent, whatever it was, um, it was not cool. I don't remember developing a strategy as a four-year-old, but clearly I decided not to know it um, as fast and as sincerely as possible. The thing that I knew that I never really managed to fully erase was that there had to be a switch over day. <laughs> and, a day when all the little boys became little girls, and vice versa. I trusted in Switch Over Day more than I trusted in Santa or the Tooth Fairy. I believed it so much that I began to feel sad about all of the little girls who would soon be boys. But it turns out there is no Santa, and there was no Switch Over Day, and I'm still not really over that. <clears throat> Each of our childhoods shapes our reality. What is real becomes what is normal. My childhood to me was completely normal. I had caring parents, annoying siblings, school. <laughs> I kept to myself, I learned to be a boy, um, to do boy stuff like rugby and Boy Scouts and go to an all-boy school and be head boy and, you know, all boy. <laughs> I'm also autistic, so... That was normal too. I doubt that helped. <laughs> Life was normal because, like everyone else, I had nothing to compare it to. I still don't. To me, being trans is normal. Um, my story is about letting each day be my normal, not your normal. Turns out pretending not to be an autistic, bisexual, teetotal, face-blind, vegetarian, trans woman is way harder <laughs> than just being me. And being authentic is so fashionable at the moment, so that's nice. Um, it's just that some people feel rather challenged when your authentic self is not remotely similar to their authentic self. I came out to myself again um, in my 30s, hopefully for the last time. Um, it was rather unexpected. It was like, surprise! <laughs> and I felt so lost and so fake. I had always thought of myself as an ally, um, but I also felt too white and too male, and too everything to be an ally. These days, um, the quiet white male is my favorite kind of ally. <laughs> the phrase lived experience, which you hear a lot, is important because that is normal, normal to me. No one can describe a normal that was never their normal. No one should speak on behalf of a normal that they will never know. But they do. 
over and over, often for us, rather than letting us speak. So it's nice to tell our own stories. Before I lived through it, I thought the discrimination would be visible or violent, something I could confront, like a boy. Sometimes it is. Sometimes you get beaten up or just shouted at. Online, it's quite violent, but also anonymous. Mostly, it is invisible and unintentional. You don't notice because there is nothing to notice. The discrimination is in my interest or supported but concerned. In inclusion speak, I am vulnerable to negative assumptions. Um, on the street, I'm mental, um, and I get asked an awful lot about my support network. It's patronizing. It's patronage. I'm oppressed not with violence, but condescension. Oppressed with assumptions of kindness. It's the kindness that grinds you down. It seems a weird thing to say, but I feel like a lot of discrimination must be like this. I'm not hated, just diminished. It seems incredible that the simplest rights, like the right to be free to exist, are still not simple. And it's cyclical, of course. Like in 1902, allowing women to vote was a radical and violently opposed idea in Australia, and amusingly helped by the usual misogynistic political machinations backfiring, but you can Google that. Even then, there were exceptions, Aboriginal natives of Australia and Africa and Asia and the Pacific Islands. In fact, that's pretty much everyone that wasn't Caucasian or Maori were consciously discriminated against until the mid-60s. Since then, we've had to do that unconsciously. LGBTQ people would certainly have been disenfranchised if our queerness was written on our skin. We have fought other battles for the right to raise children or get married or not get sent down for fucking. Not sure if it's still illegal in jail, but maybe we just turn a blind eye to that. And gay marriage is our most recent triumph. <laughs> that took a while. <laughs> After all, there's written evidence that gay marriage happened in ancient Egypt. Not on bits of sun-baked clay, but in the Bible, in the Sifra. It's Leviticus chapter 18, if you're into scripture. And but being in the Bible is not the point. The point is, it was normal until the Judeo-Christian God Hashem legislated against it. Then it became abnormal and immoral. And 5,000 years later, the Australian Parliament fixed that. Dean Smith and Tim Winton gave memorable speeches. Penny Wong denounced the vitriolic debate that surrounded an unnecessary plebiscite. And George Brandis. Admittedly, George waited until the fight was over to share his unequivocal, impassioned support. Like all political ephemera, he said, much fades into history. But people do remember the 1967 referendum, that great act of inclusion of Indigenous Australians. And I predict that, like the 1967 referendum, this decision by the Australian people will come to be seen as one of those occasional shining moments which stand out in our nation's history, about which will, people will still speak with admiration in decades, indeed, in centuries to come. It's stirring and heartfelt and um, total bullshit, but you know that. In the real world, the 1967 referendum and the 2017 Marriage Act are shining memorials to Aussie bigotry. They sit comfortably on the national timeline, repression being a national timeline, or a national pastime. And my trans story is part of that story. It's all the same story all across the world. Same horse, different jockey. Here in New South Wales, I had to have a vaginoplasty before I could change my birth certificate. You can Google that too. There is one, I think, surgeon in Australia at the moment, and out-of-pocket costs came to tens of thousands of dollars. I like to imagine applying equivalent conditions to new drivers. To get your P-plates, you would need to visit the only car dealership in Australia and buy a $20,000 car, and then you can pay to upgrade to a full license. Seems equally fair. After surgery, two more doctors were required to examine me and sign pieces of paper saying, yes, the doc had indeed neutered me, that I was emasculated, evirated, capenized, and frankly, I was very happy about it. It was a bit confusing when Germaine Greer said that the procedure didn't make me a woman, because that is exactly what the government told me did make me a woman. My operation changed the world for me, but it genuinely did not change anything for the world. It's barbaric, really, not to mention an expensive way to get your passport on F. 
It's almost as barbaric as being taught to hate yourself as a child. In 1988, it became illegal in the UK to teach awareness of LGBTQ issues in schools. Of course, I didn't know that. I didn't know anything. Um, the bill was known as Section 28, and it lasted for 25 years, and it leaves a very deep psychological scar. And if that sounds familiar, it might be because Mark Latham's Education Legislation Amendment Parental Rights Bill is currently in front of the New South Wales government. Go government. It's targeted at trans kids, rather than our entire community, but in every other way, it's the same idea. It's almost funny <laughs> that people think that activists can teach kids to be trans when it's the exact opposite. I'm not straight, <laughs> I'm not cisgendered, but I learned to pretend so hard that I believed I was for 30 years. And that's a battle I will fight all my life, not the one with the turfs, the one with my own deep-rooted disgust and self-loathing. It's the side salad to my dysphoria. I suffer from dysphoria, not being trans. There are other illnesses where you will damage your own mind and your body in order to show that you're sick and suffering, but not many where doctors make you suffer <laughs> or where the government expects you to pay tens of thousands of dollars for major surgery before it judges your condition authentic. So denying kids that education leads to adults like me. Like me, trans kids will still be trans when they grow up and will spend painful years in their closet. Like me, they will have lifelong mental health problems. Or we could give kids space, time and information. We can educate them, love them, accept them, affirm them. We can support their parents. We can support their teachers. You see what happens. Those are the options. You're normal or they're normal. I never knew and will never know what it is like to feel comfortable in my gender. I will always be trans. I would trade all my privileges for something you don't realize you have. 